So in case you haven't heard, I have been at an attempt to master my mother's collards for the past 15 years, her collard greens. Now, if you asked me in 2005, you would see that I wouldn't have cared. I was above the demands of domesticity, even though my living situation was based on my preparing a wonderful family, their meals three times a week. So I lived in a family's house and I cooked for them three times a week. And in exchange, I got to live uh, rent free, which was an amazing deal when I was in divinity school. So cooking was part of my life, but I just didn't care about food. I actually saw it as more of a burden or just a means to get somewhere. But something about taking my first call or moving into my first space alone and untethered and unbothered maybe, something told me that I needed to do some investigating and some learning, some digging, some real meal preparations. So I went to our local discounted home store and bought a huge stock pot. And I found the store that sold fresh collard greens. And I dug up, which was really rough to do in Fairfield County where I was living, Connecticut. I dug up the place that had smoked meats because I wanted turkey necks, smoked turkey necks. And I knew I needed those. So I procured them. And truth be told, without asking, my muscle memory told me much of what I needed anyway. Because when I had helped my mom in my childhood, she wanted me to handle the annoying bits like peeling the garlic and the onion, getting the pot to a rolling boil, properly cleaning the greens, which anyone who's prepared them from scratch knows is a whole thing. You wash and you rinse several times. The sink is dedicated to greens for hours to soak and to get clean enough for consumption. And it was then with a large and a strong dose of shame that I called my mom 15 years ago from my new kitchen just out of divinity school. I was determined to make her greens. And I couldn't tell you why then, but I had some things and was ready to turn on the stove. And then I just called her. Now I realize that many of you have not had the privilege of meeting Karen Ann Edmund Spellman. But what I will say is that you don't wanna walk into any advisory conversation like this one unprepared. And I thought I was prepared, but as we got into it, I realized that I might have benefited from a pre-talk before I went to the store. And this is a mistake I will never make again. But anyway, mom, who was busy with something as usual, took the time to walk me through her greens recipe, which I attempted that day. And they turned out all right. They were good, but they weren't hers, clearly. Clearly, I'd need to stand next to her, this time with more interest in order to work through the adjustments of the recipe. And any good cook understands this nuance, right? Someone can give you the basics, but it's the adjustments, the addition of a little more baking soda or pickle juice or the extra dash of kosher salt or the shake of cayenne this many times. These are what bring you to the place of safety and familiarity of the food. And that just can't happen over the phone or so I thought. Now, 15 years later, stuck at home without a clear source of pre-prepared food, which is what we'd been living off of for the years prior here in this house, in my family, I will admit, I had to find another way, much like the rest of you. So I started calling my parents and my aunts and my uncles. I knew what I loved from what they had crafted in their own kitchens and in their backyards. And I wanted to be able to offer that to my family in a way that quite frankly, hadn't been important to me before. But we were able to count on those times together where we would go to their backyard and eat their delicious food throughout the year. And those rituals, we, we, we knew. I didn't need to cook this food for my family because they would, but this isn't happening right now thanks to this expletive pandemic. But as I called my aunts and my uncles and, and everyone and told them, which I realize in retrospect could have sounded a bit macabre, I just wanted to ensure 
that their discoveries and culinary adventures wouldn't be lost. And I wanted to learn them from them and find a way to record and share them forever, just in case. And in that way, relatives who probably would not reveal their secret ingredients have been willing to share and new food ways they're opening up. Our text today from Second Isaiah, which means it's a text of people in exile, points to a weary people. It acknowledges an experience of way too much where folks are asked to run without whatever it takes to move swiftly, to move somewhere, literally to move, which they had to do. They were in exile, to move somewhere without what it would take to get there. They go because they must, but they're exhausted, weary, the Bible says, which makes this text from Isaiah all the more prescient. And so I ask the question, from what are you in exile? I wonder, is it your strength? Is it your endurance, your nourishment? If the answer to any of these is yes, I think you're in good company. I think you're joined by the whole of humanity right now. Maybe you're encouraged by the good headlines of the day, thanks be. Or maybe you've named and proclaimed 2021 to be your year. And I'd like to be right with you. I pray that it is yours and mine and all of ours, which I hope it will be. But the prophet says, may you run and not be weary. And I know a bunch of y'all. And you're thinking, run? <laughs> Are you expletive kidding me? Run where? On what? Have you talked to my knees? Run? You'd be lucky if I could figure out a way out the door, let alone run. And if you meet this text with that kind of questioning, may I just say, you're in brilliant company. But what I'd also say is this. On this spiritual journey, God is prepared to enrich you with whatever is required. God will give you what is needed. God has your blessing and God will provide. May you run and not be weary, the Bible says. But if you've had COVID or any number of afflictions that may put a barrier in your path, you know and remember just how much breath is a privilege. What I mean is that just trying to breathe can be a journey, a struggle. And if that's true for you or someone you love, I just want to say that God sees you. And it's our job, our obligation, our privilege even, to see you too. May you run and not be weary. What does it mean to run? Is it a physical act, perhaps? There are plenty of places or needs for us to flee, and there's certainly value and endurance, but I think it's not just that. I think it's also a symbol of liberation, of freedom, of the chance to move, to define your own space and to go there and to make your space just so. However, to get there, to sustain this movement, we have to be nourished which brings me back to my mom's collard greens. Somehow, as I embarked on this, this here, this ministry, I knew the ancestral familiarity of nourishment, but I didn't have the skills or the means to sustain that nourishment. What I needed to keep on to make it, I couldn't buy in a store or order from a restaurant. And believe you me, I tried. And when I called my mom for her collards recipe, I didn't even realize it, but I was in a state of desperation. I knew I had some hard stuff to do and that I would wear myself out if I tried it without unlocking this piece of wisdom she had. 
And 15 years ago, she unlocked the secrets for me. And I learned that you keep a bottle of dill pickles in your fridge and a box of baking soda there too. I learned to keep frozen turkey necks in the freezer and red pepper flakes on the shelves. Most importantly, from my world to hers, I learned how to dip a spoon into the pot liquor to learn what needed adjusting. And in so doing, I learned to cook the greens that fueled movements not quite like my mom, but there are things in there, in our own histories, in our own ancestral lineages that feed our bodies and nourish our souls. This, this week, this gorgeous gift arrived, which is Clancy Miller's For the Culture. Let's see, let me make sure it's in, there we go which I highly recommend you get yourself a copy of. It's available to order online. And in this beautiful magazine, there's this incredible recipe, which I put in quotes, by Alicia Somner, which is called A Recipe for Okra Soup. I'm going to read this recipe to you. One, read a book that awakens within you memories that do not belong to you, yet have somehow imprinted themselves in the underlining of your skin. They are of you, but not you. You cannot remember when they became a part of you, but you know that they are a catalyst for your being and becoming and undoing. You know that the undoing is a rewilding a return to a wildness that you do not yet know, or maybe you do. Two, remember. Remember that you are of your father. Remember that your father is of his mother. Remember that his mother is of her mother who is of her mother who was of the low country where the sandy hills that now stretch along the South Carolina coast were once the ocean floor. Three, fix in your mind the hands of your father's mother. How they were the hands of her mother and her mother's mother and how those hands may have touched indigo and rice on the plantations that lined the sandy hills that were once the ocean floor from which you came. And think of her skin, salty from sweat and blackened by sun body bent in the shape of a U as she cut down rice. Four, count on your thin-skinned lady fingers the number of times the spaces between her ribs cried out for rest. Five, go back to your garden where you are growing okra six plants so far, each one unfolding to receive you in the morning with your thin skinned fingers and you shaped body as you wish it into being. Call forth the hands of the hands of the hands of the mothers you never knew and yet somehow know. Six, find yourself wanting to return to the soft and wild sandy hills of the low country, because every grain of sand is a seed of your origin, every splash of salt water a sip of your lineage, a sip of your lineage. Our recipes carry stories, and they're the pathways to our past. We won't all know our food ways as they're so beautifully called, but our bodies do. There's something about taking in a food that comes so deeply and ancestrally ours, made by hands from the generations back that we never saw. And yet, as this food is prepared, we learn the lessons our ancestors meant us to know about our bodies like avoiding allergens as must be, 
They bring proteins and nutrients that our bodies can actually digest without suffering. We don't always get to pre-know these food ways, but there's something in us that knows and recognizes them when we find them. And for me, that's collard greens, but for you, it might be something quite different. What I do know is that if, if I am expected to run, let alone to run and not be weary, I have to draw on more than what I've already got in me banked up and stored and ready to go. To run without weariness means something beyond human capacity in and of itself and on its own. Otherwise put, beyond what one person can do, which reminds us of the point of all of this. We aren't the point, we're not even the means, we're just part of it. But it's not on us. It's not all on us. God in texts like these is saying to us, remember y'all, it's on me. I know where you are. I see your weariness. I know you don't know the path or the recipe, but I got this. It goes beyond you. I got this. Your ancestors got you too. And it goes beyond even your most abundant gifts. But what we have to remember is that what it doesn't go beyond is God. Meanwhile, it's up to us to learn the ingredients and practice the steps because we will be called upon to help to prepare the meal. Just remember, it's not your table. It never had to be your God. Our God has already set the table in the presence of every foe and in the presence of the ancestors. So now, may our cups overflow. Amen.